So what's up, guys? It's your favorite sexy host again, me and Che. And uh, just a quick warning for today's episode, we are going to be talking about some sensitive subjects revolving around the topic of mental health. I'm going to be talking about, you know, trigger warning, suicide and self-harm and just my personal journey with mental health. And so I just wanted to let you guys know, just, you know, you've been warned that if you go into this episode, that these things are going to be talked about. So proceed with caution. Yo, what's good, Che? How are you doing? Do you have a you have a good weekend, Mel? Dude, I actually am doing really good. I have like a sudden burst of energy because I just had one of those morning faps that like really energized me. I feel you can go in kind of either direction. It can either be like, oh, I need to go back to sleep, or it can just like give you that electricity in your body that you need to start the day. I um, totally. So understand. I'm feeling pretty good. Yeah, the the morning fap for me, it's either like I would agree. Sometimes it like just puts you down and you and you relax, or it for me it's a cleanse. It's like I need to get this fap out because I'm my brain's too in too much fap space, and also because like <laughs> yeah, like I'm floating around, like I'm uh, like I'm too easily distracted by like boobs or something like that. And if I do so <laughs> well, your much, your brain is floating around in the fap space. What do you mean an, by the fap space? The fap space is like when you just you need to jizz. Like you're you, if you don't <laughs> jizz, you're just going to be constantly kind of distracted all day. And so mm-hmm. you're like like there's this chick I follow on Instagram, Miss Me a Fit. And she's like like thick, has like these big fake tits, and like she's hot she's, as fuck. She's hot as fuck. Mm-hmm, and it, mm-hmm. and if I'm in the fap space. I her she always pops up on my Instagram. I'm I'm scrolling. I'm looking at her page. I probably like click at her OnlyFans and then stare at when it. When you for say a fab space, is it like you you like your physical body exists in this like fab space ether, or are you mentally in your head in a fab yeah, space? Yeah, sp- it's a spiritual thing. It's like yeah, it's like my soul is in <laughs> it's there. It's a spiritual thing. Yeah. yeah, it's like your it's your nut chakra. Exactly, my nut chakra is like yeah. is, is it needs to be released. It's like at a pressure build. So then when mm-hmm. you release it, you can just focus on work. You're not distracted by anything that might be like fap adjacent. Uh, fap adjacent, dude. Yeah. This is totally building into like our nut cinematic universe that I yes. think maybe we touched upon in a previous episode, or maybe I had a wet dream about it. But like. You know, nut cinematic universe, the NCU. I think like you as the nut bender using your nut chakra, like where you're like, oh yeah, like I really want to use my nut chakra, but I have to like first meditate in the fab space. Yeah, till you get the nut power. Yeah, no, I think yeah. we're, <laughs> on to we're on to something. Dude, I just it, it's just so funny because I've actually envisioned like what nut bending would actually look like in the context of Avatar: The Last Airbender. So for anybody who like doesn't know what that is, it's like. Basically, you know, you can take elements like air, water. So we'll take air and you can do like water bending, right? So you can like control water and be like, uh, and and move it through time to attack people. And then it, it's just so funny to me, the idea of like nutting being like, uh, and then be like, I'm going to nut bend where it's like you nut out the jizz, but then you like are controlling it and it's levitating. You're like, cool. Now I'm going to use this jizz that I'm levitating with my nut bending powers and I have it like pierce through someone's heart and like kill them with my actual nut. Exactly. You could have like nut come out and like shape it into an and be like ready for combat with this nut. Yeah, it's, yeah I mean, yeah, no, I and it, it's funny because it's like the more you nut, the bigger the axe gets. Yes, and you, you also be like limited to how many you could do in a day. Like it would be because you can only create so much nut at a time. So you would either have to like store your nut and then have like this like vicious nut unleash, like have like a freezer full of nut and then become like <laughs> like the nut in the nut bending universe, the person with like the biggest nut reserves. <laughs> they're really running the show. They got it's like ammunition, dude. The nut reserves. That's so good. You know, it, it's funny because like, I, I kind of when you were saying the spiritual thing, I was just like, oh, maybe like nut is actually just like this evergreen like spiritual thing that flows through you, where it's like, yeah, you have the physical jizz right but then like the power of the nut can be something even greater than the jizz where the jizz is just like the physical vehicle but like the spirit of the nut like is actually the thing that's driving it i'm getting too into like the anime shit where it's just like oh yeah like in um you tower of Avatar. god it, yeah like where i'm like in tower of god they have shinzu and that's just like this general ether where it's like um where <laughs> it, it'd be funny in the nut cinematic universe where like okay so in tower of god there's a thing called like shinzu where it's just like the general energy that exists and you can just manipulate it but in the nut cinematic universe there could just be like 
general jizz floating around, like general jizz particles floating around from everybody who was nutted over time and it like evaporates or whatever. I don't know science, but, and it's like us like manifesting that nut where it's just like, oh shit, like I personally didn't jizz enough, but good thing there's like nut particles over there that I can manifest and use for this yeah. giant nut sword that I need to use in this battle right now. That's like, um, like you, you, you're, you watch DBZ, right? You watch Dragon Ball Z. Like yeah, when he's making the spirit bomb, shit. when he's making the spirit bomb and he has to pull <gasps> energy from other people and animals and yeah. everything, he takes energy from all living things in order to make the bomb bigger. So you could like yeah. pull nut from other people and, <laughs> and then use their nut as your own. <laughs> Your own ability from non benders, you take their yeah nuts. <laughs> from not from non nut benders, just yeah. the average plebeians, yeah. you know, just those just the fucking normies, you know, and it, we would create like a tiered society between like the regular plebeians who can't harness their own nut bending powers and us, the chosen, the chosen like the chosen the avatar nut benders. I was like, we were born with this ability to manipulate our nut, but you, you can only nut regularly. And like, who's like, because you have like the Fire Nation, who is like the evil, yeah. they're the evil guys in Avatar, who would be yeah. like the evil people within the nut bending universe like i'm thinking oh, the like people who don't want you to nut like the mormons or something yeah, i don't know like just anti-nut? people who don't want you to nut yeah yeah yeah, yeah. like a chastity kind of thing like a chastity. To be honest i can say this because i'm asian but the south korean christian church in the america south- for sure does not want you to nut yeah they don't i want you they're anti-nut there oh my god so i i threaded this the other day but like i think every East Asian person living in America has been a victim of the South Korean Baptist church at some point. Like, literally every single Asian I know has been like, you went through that too. Yeah, where it's just like, um, at some point, if you're an East Asian living in America, just at some point in your life, like a like one of those really intense South Korean, like super Christian churches, like gets a hold of you while you're in a weak time. And it's just sort of like, hey join us join this cult of like guilt and shame like that i mean that was the first time i had ever been like really publicly shamed for masturbating was in one of those settings yeah you told me about that that uh they like actually made you like go on stage and like apologize for not yeah no that was just like that that was just some weird shit that happened in college where basically uh i was going through a, a a specific time in my life and then uh in college this south korean baptist cult approached me during this week time it was just like do you want free barbecue and i was like yes i do want free barbecue and then um you know six months later you end up living with those people who give you the love that you never had in your childhood and then you're sharing a bunk bed with this girl who's like the star child of the church and um and basically what happened was like we had like a bunk bed because it was college right and i kind of thought that i was always jerking off in in a really stealth way that she couldn't understand but you know i i overestimated i I mean i underestimated her ability because like six months of us living together she's like sleeping up top and i'm just like okay she's asleep i'm just gonna like rub one out real quick and i'm like rubbing one out and then she like peeps her head over and she's like oh melissa is that you and i was like is what me is what me she's like oh the shaking of the bed and i was just like uh yeah i have a leg i have a leg twitch she didn't believe me she told our church leader on me and then the church leader ended up having like leading me into this intervention where jerk intervention like, she's yes. addicted to jerk <laughs> yes no like <laughs> like yes exactly it was a jerk intervention where it was like me and these 50 other church kids who had also been caught masturbating and then we just had to go into this auditorium like confess to these groups and they and they like and it was funny because they delineated like who was jerking it versus who was having sex and so there are these like tears of like of shame of, of just like oh of shame yeah and then so i was in like the lowest tier right because it's like oh damn you weren't even getting with anyone you were just fucking and and then um yeah but like yeah shame is a great emotion it's my it's my favorite and oh, most productive dude and if you offered me free barbecue i would join a cult like are you fucking kidding me you got like yeah. brisket and a smoked chicken and cornbread i'm i'm my morals are out the window for fucking well-cooked <laughs> meat yeah, yeah. dude 100 percent um and I like awesome. how did they. Did you go on a bender this weekend? Did I go on a bender? Um, okay, so I didn't really bender that hard. So yeah, I missed my flight back to um, 
what's what's this place new york from vegas yeah no from no when i saw that yeah <laughs> what's this like uh like when you were like oh yeah i missed my friend from vegas i was like oh he had a good time i didn't even go on that hard of a bender i just underestimated the vegas airport i show up to the airport mm. like an hour before my flight that's how i roll mm -hmm. all the time and it always yeah. works but then of course vegas is a super busy airport and my bag got stopped and all this stuff and so i just ended up missing my flight um uh, but my weekend was pretty sick. I'd never been to Vegas before. And Vegas You've is like... You've never been to Vegas before? No, no. I mean, I'm uh, like... in. I, oh, I keep forgetting you're Canadian. Yeah, I'm Canadian. So like, uh, I mean, I don't think... Can I'm, Canadians do go, but it's obviously a way bigger oh, trip I mean, I'm, I'm not saying like because you're Canadian, you're not going to Vegas. I was saying because you're a bad person and because mm. you don't deserve to. That's <laughs> what I was really saying. I was saying you haven't gone to Vegas because it has something to do with you personally. That you that has nothing to do I'm, with you being Canadian. It's yeah. just your inherent self worth is tied into it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but it is like America on steroids. I'd never seen yeah. like it, it. It's they were like, okay, you you know what a mall is? Okay, we're gonna turn that up to like eleven. So everything's big, everything's bright. You can get food at any time. Every like restaurant is bumping all the time. Gambling, drinking. You want to drink in the streets? You want to you want to fuck some uh, uh, some chick? It's uh, twenty five bucks. Like fucking there. Everything is just like go 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 go. I was in awe. I didn't realize that the not the casinos, the hotels are basically like cities. That you're when you're within the hotel, you can like go to a buffet, go shopping, eat, go gambling, everything within your hotel, and you never have to fucking leave if you don't want to. It's it, an amusement park. It's literally in, a, yeah. in like an adult amusement park because yes. you just kind of hear Vegas and you're like, oh, Vegas. And then you go, especially if you go with me and Brad, uh, scumbag dad, who we had on a previous episode. Yeah. It's just like you go and you're like, holy shit, this is a whole like constructed world and ecosystem of its own. Yeah. Like it's just it's its own country. Like Vegas is literally its own country that operates on its own rules and on its own time. And there's a really specific energy there. Like everybody who is in Vegas, who's in Vegas is in like a similar energy. You know yeah. what I mean? Everyone's just sort of like, woo, party. Like party consumption, like throw your care to the wind. Like everyone's like drink. Like I, the amount of people I just saw with like a red solo, just like walking around, and then like people smoking indoors and shit. Like shit you don't see anywhere fucking else. Vegas is like yeah, yeah. We don't give a fuck. They're like, did Wait, you so bring were you money? There doing shows where you there just partying? Yeah, like I had I had I had uh, four shows this weekend there, uh, and then um yeah, and then I was supposed to fucking swing back and fucking miss miss my way back. But it was, anyway, it was so. But now you're back. So like, how are you feeling in New York? Like, how is it? How's it going on? Well, definitely, because people say New York's overwhelming. I'm like, this is like nothing compared to like the sensory overload of Vegas. Like two, three days mm -hmm. is like enough over there. Um, mm -hmm. I just got back late last night, so I haven't really like done anything. Like, got my apartment stuff kind of just got like a good night's sleep. Nothing too crazy. But it's gonna be nice to like walk around the neighborhood again and like go get my coffee and do my stuff. Like, I want to get back to my routine because I was mm -hmm. gone for a while. I was at a comedy festival before vegas and then i was in vegas for shows so i was gone for like a week straight um so it's nice you're it's doing hella shit hella shit getting done man i literally got exhausted hearing you talk about it i'm just sitting here and i was like wow that sounds like a lot we're we're working we're working my fucking tiktok's popping again too my tiktok was Hell ass yeah. for so long and so like mm -hmm. the the numbers are up on tiktok which is fucking great uh and then yeah just getting the getting the shit done i just got a new pc that's like fucking sick this big gaming Dude, fuck PC. yeah I i'm still it. working on getting unbanned on my platforms yeah. for the very thing that we're talking about in this podcast it's kind of funny and and I don't know if ironic's the right word, mm. uh, but like, it, it, it's just funny because like, okay, so on TikTok, when you go to search my name, you get like a drug warning, <laughs> and no it's just way. It, like, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, on TikTok, when you search up my name, like, it's like this weird thing where on every single one of my platforms, I'm working with my respective point of contact there to get me like unbanned for my library of of long sex content and i'm just and i'm just like okay how much of it do i have to take down? it's a funny problem to have and it's also like and it's and it's kind of funny that it's happening now uh but like on tiktok when you search my name there's just like my profile doesn't show up there's just this warning that's like beware of drugs yeah which is kind of funny and awesome but you know i need to get that fixed so people can see my content and then exactly, on instagram yeah. Yeah, and then, and then on Instagram, I'm, like, uh, temporarily post-banned because I need to clean up my sex content. They, like, flagged a bunch of shit where they were, like, this is too... I, I, and, it's, and it's weird because, like, you know, 
they're like, oh, this one clip of you showing your butt crack a little too much. And I was like, that is so tame compared to other stuff I've said. But okay, cool. The the butt crack clip will take that one I wish, because they obviously all these places have like terms and conditions, the community guidelines. But the community guidelines are so vague. They're so they vague. They are so vague. And I, if there was better communication, I would stay within the lines. If I knew it's like, hey, don't say this. Like, because there's specific things they don't want. Like on mm -hmm. TikTok, if you show anything Pornhub, like my buddy got his account taken down for showing the Pornhub logo. Like he filmed the corner, was doing a jerk off joke and like filmed the corner so you could see that he was on the Pornhub website. Count banned, all, all gone, everything gone. And there's like no transparency around it. And, just tell us. Or I mean, yeah, I mean, and it's not even transparency. It's just like, it's also really hard to act because it's like, you know, no one's going to go and read like the whole list of community guidelines. I'm like, I... I can't even read. I like I literally don't know how to read. <laughs> like I don't know how to read. Like I haven't read a book in so long. So when I see a long block of text, I kind of black out in my mind and I'm just like, uh, make what? a video. Make a video. Make a video that's like, hey, this when and a video on each one, like when it comes to sex, when it comes to guns, when it comes to drugs, this, 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 and show examples. Be like, this is okay. This mm -hmm. isn't okay. And then I'll we have a better idea. It's just communication, man. That's all and we also, want. And also and for like for really important topics too, because they'll say stuff where it's like, oh, you can talk about this in an educational way. And then like but then that definition is foggy, right? So for example, when talking about mental health, like I will like be really open about my mental health on my platforms and sometimes it'll get flagged for like, oh, this is too dark or like this is too um like triggering or, or or whatever or it's like you can't joke about this and it's like no i can joke about this because i'm literally I, i'm a per it's kind of like i feel like i'm mentally ill so I'm, I you're can like i'm in it i'm jokes. just talking about i'm myself. just having yeah i'm just literally talking about my experience um and that's the topic of today actually is my mental health journey and i'm like super excited to talk about so welcome to thank you come again with mel ong and chaterena the podcast where we joke so hard you'll be covered in laughter by the time we finish and i am so excited to just talk very openly about my mental health journey where i am now kind of where i started um right now i finally feel mentally healthy and good for the first time in my life honestly um and it's and it's pretty wild I think like mental health is one of those things that I love talking about because I obviously I like suffer through it but because I know it helps people see someone talk about it because they feel like they can't talk about it like Che have you ever struggled with mental health at all or I used to have like bad social anxiety and uh and was like just very insecure and that was just like a, an upbringing thing I don't have a like not a great relationship with my mom and like bad just like things passed on um I'm a freak Human. with a lot of that stuff where like I just basically every time I feel like off or something I do like a solo mushroom trip and I just fuck it is steer out of it um that's but kind I think of most people struggle with confidence right like it's like in society like especially if you're a dude right like i think like like men in america have been brought up i like up until recently because we're in the millennial generation like so i just turned 30 like two months ago and like that sent me into this whole existential like fuck now i'm like thinking about all this shit because i kind of was like I'm going to fuck around and go on a bender until I'm 30. And then once I'm 30, I'm going to figure all my shit out. And then that's what happened. So then two months ago, I turned 30 and I was like, cool, I'm going to get off this bender and figure my shit out. And then I got on um, bipolar medication. I've been pretty open on all my platforms about being bipolar and mentally ill. Like, I think that I um, am lucky to not have the shame around it that a lot of people have because I'm autistic and I don't register that. Uh, but actually, cause I, I mean, I am, so I can say that. Um, and people don't think that I am because it presents differently in women, which also just is a testament to like how much the dialogue around mental health, like people just don't know that much. Right. And then there's a stigma and it's hard to talk about. Um, but it's way easier to talk about if there's someone hot and sexy on camera talking about it. Dude, there was, so. uh, what's her name? Uh, not Jordan Jensen. Uh, super funny comic. She's got a couple specials on Netflix. I can't believe I can't remember her name right now. But she names are hard to remember. She she has bits about being bipolar, and um, she's like, when I found out I was bipolar, they they like 
sh- show you other fame like or show you like famous who are bipolar like did you know that selena gomez is bipolar and she's like oh she's pretty like that's like oh taylor the- tomlinson taylor tomlinson yes yes yes, yes. i've seen that she- i've seen that exact clip because somebody sent it to me yeah. because people send me like all this you know whenever there's like a bipolar thing people are like oh maybe she and i'm like yeah actually do send it to me it like is helpful like it is yeah you know i mean that shit does make you feel seen because like um, you know, I grew up in a traditional, like, conservative immigrant family where it's like, okay, so I'm um, I'm Taiwanese Chinese, and so both my parents had very much like a traditional conservative mindset around something like mental health. Like, the conversation around mental health wasn't even a conversation until after I graduated college, I think. Because um, so yeah, like I when I, I remember when I was in college, um. It was just like, like mental health wasn't being talked about, so it was just a bunch of like eighteen to twenty two year olds all just being like, oh, the... and everyone at Berkeley was super mentally ill. Just like just everyone during that time, um, like because it was like the I don't know, it was like the Skrillex era. Like just it just hadn't been talked about yet, and then I didn't even know that I had an issue. Like I didn't even know that what I was experiencing wasn't normal until after I graduated, and um, I started working full time and I was just having that like that like first job corporate anxiety of like oh shit if I fuck this up then I'm gonna I'm gonna lose homeless. everything yeah exactly when exactly you, I mean, like, you're gonna you get, lose everything yeah when you get your first gig and you're you're uh, out of college and you don't have any savings you're actually in debt and you're like okay well, well this is like if this doesn't go good and you have like one bad day at work you're like oh it's done it's done I'm fucked I got nowhere to go I got no no help and th- and you're just stressed about it constantly it's like the did worst you go to college in canada uh i did i did uh two semesters of a bullshit college that uh, where i took a scuba diving instructor course um so i became a scuba diving instructor through college yeah, wait, oh my god i remember the story yeah. that's awesome and then i just <laughs> fucked off i just fucked off and i went to mexico and i just like taught scuba diving like i and it was cheap too i think it was like five grand for the two semesters or something like that wait so wait, I, wait so let me get this so you graduated high school and you're like i'm gonna go to college but in, but by college college i mean i'm gonna become a scuba diving instructor so my parents wanted me to go straight to university uh and i was like fuck i fucking don't want to go to school i hate school yeah. i was bad at school i wasn't doing like i and their own there was like very few schools that would accept me with my grades even at mm-hmm. the when i applied to this course they're like yeah send in your grades and i never did and they kind of were like hey did you send those in i was like yeah yeah, yeah you guys should have them and they never followed up and then i just got in i just got in on other That's people's awesome. A mismanagement, which is a place where I flourish. If other I mean, people... I honestly, I honestly think that they probably saw you and they're like, "This guy has a huge cock. Let's let him in." They're like, "Just get him in," and all, and also, just get like, him in. They think they need a certain amount of kids to run the course, and they're like, "We, we just got to get as many of these fucking kids in here as we can." But I just use it as an excuse to get the fuck out and like go travel and go see shit yeah. and just like be free. Yeah, exactly. No, like exactly. Wait, so you so you mentioned like uh. When you graduated and you had your first gig, you were feeling that kind of like, oh shit, like oh, yeah. it's all gonna be over when if I, I fuck up. When I first, uh, when I got like my first job uh, teaching diving, I remember like the one of the first dives that I was like leading on my own was like kind of a shit show, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna get fired. I had no money. I had like, mm-hmm. and I didn't take anything. My parents gave me, I think they gave me. 400 bucks maybe like 500 bucks mm. um as like a going away gift just like here and that was like i had that and like a little bit of savings and then i never took anything from anyone i, I was like i'm gonna do everything on my own i'm never gonna yep. take money from anyone i'm never gonna take anything yep. from anyone that like i'm gonna do it all my own mentality that's the key to freedom right yeah i mean it's true it's like because it is true you have that it's it's like it's a healthy and unhealthy thing like I was too unhealthy with it in where that was something I had to work through where I wouldn't even like if someone got me a gift or something I had this like repulsion towards it I would have like oh what you think I can't do it on my own what do you think I what do you think I need your help like I would get angry if someone tried to help me with something which is not a place because they're trying to be kind it's not a mental place you have to want to be so it's like something I had to work through to on my on myself um that's really healthy And that you, like, recognize that and work through that. Because not a lot of men I know do that. (laughs) I think you – like, I don't know if you do this, but do you spend time just, like – I spend time just sitting and thinking sometimes. Like, I'll go for a walk and just, like, no podcast, no nothing. That's actually most of my time. Yeah, just go through your brain. Most of my time is just me alone with my thoughts. That's most of my time. Yeah, and so, Um, like – Obviously, like, you know, like – 
I'll be doing something like jerking off. Um, <laughs> um, no, well, but like, go ahead. The, but what do you dig out? Like, what do you when you spend this alone time? What do you pull out of it? Um, I channel a lot of my, or I mean, I process a lot of my thoughts through the act of like doing something, right? Because I feel like it's for me personally. If I'm just like sitting there alone with my thoughts, it doesn't really feel that good. But if I'm like making music about my thoughts, if I'm writing about my thoughts, if I'm like walking outside about my thoughts, if I'm just doing something at the same time while processing information, I think it's just a lot of, um, it's a lot of self therapy, to be honest, in addition to r real therapy. Like, um, I read a lot of Mark Manson. Do you know who that writer is? He, he does the subtle uh, art of not giving a fuck. Yeah. 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 I read not that one. He did another one. Can't yeah. Remember. It's everything. I don't know. Just it's it, in general. Um, I like reading, life philosophy stuff because essentially I think that I've been um, struggling with my mental health for so long and have been on this journey of like trying to figure it out for so long that I've kind of done everything at this point. It's like, it's like funny, you know, cause I, I'm 30 and then we'll just have a conversation with someone and it'll be like, you're duh, have you tried the, and I'm just sort of like, yeah, I've been trying actually a lot of shit my entire yeah. life. Um, where, where like, you know, I, I think that, in my song oldest sibling i wrote this i wrote this rap and one of the lines is generational trauma is a family tradition uh as a joke but it but it but it's true right like i think that a lot of uh second generation children of immigrants care like in america like like you know carry this trauma and it's not really been spoken about well i will everything everywhere all at once maybe did a good job of like that specific experience but but still like there isn't like enough cathartic dialogue around it where you know you grow up and you're like a child right so you don't know what's going on and then your parents at home are like hey this is how things are and they're taking that from their culture and it's like totally different from what you're learning at school and like American culture and then yeah. so you grow up in this like really intense tension in this like really intense home tension where it it just makes you mentally ill because you have no you have no healthy way of ever processing your or understanding your feelings ever right because it's like you know you go to school and then all the kids or at least this is my experience where I was like um I feel like I went to a lot of schools where I was like the only not white person or I'd be like uh there just wouldn't be a lot of other Asians and then like in America then you learn about like oh race is like a thing that people it's a like big oh you're deal. not yeah. yeah like what like and, and that factors into like all of it right like all of mental health I think um is like I think so much of your brain is just like a mix of genetics and also the cumulative reaction to like every experience that you've had in your life like i'm actually curious like what at what age did you think you started to become more confident uh i think it was like maybe 21 22 21 i remember i had to uh this was like after i stopped working as a scuba diving instructor but i was still in mexico i had to like sell tours to get by so like you know when you walk like the main street strip in like a street and people are like hey come take like a catamaran tour and stuff like that so there was mm -hmm. uh i was working for a call center they went under they didn't process my visa paperwork so i needed to get some job that you could do without papers uh and that was what i found and so I was doing that for a while, but that forced me to step out of my comfort zone and like approach people and, and talk to strangers. And I remember how uncomfortable I was to do that. And then when I started doing it over and over and over again, and then how much, like how that fear went away. Cause that's like a big part of like overcoming any sort of anxiety. It's like, just do the thing that makes you anxious because mm -hmm. then your brain learns like, Oh, nothing bad happens if you do this. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not going to die, right? Exactly. So going through that process and then doing that and then having that anxiety lift. And I to the point where I was like, yeah, I felt free from something. And I was like going up to strangers in bars and just starting conversations. Just, where are you guys from? Just because I was like addicted to this new feeling of not being like afraid in every social setting, uh, which was you're great. You're like, oh, shit, this is like. Oh, it's feels freedom. normal and good and like, it's liberating. Like, I didn't even know that I had anxiety until I graduated where it was like where it's like okay like growing up you know my parents like they had their own mental illness that uh was just like their trauma from immigration but you know like i, I just understand that that generation of parents didn't have the 
access to the sorts of mental resources that we have now. And then it's like, you know, it just, it, it passes on, right? It, it's like a cycle. And then so I grew up like very anxious and I just kind of didn't even, because my parents were anxious because it was like the whole like, uh, starvation mindset, like save money. Yeah, your parents like the thing with the immigrant, or like I think anyone who grew up with immigrant parents are like one. My dad was from Haiti, my mom was from Canada, but my mom grew up mm-hmm. pretty poor. Um, mm-hmm. Is that that there's that like lots of times these people are just underwater. So like the yeah. stress that you're taking on, it's like they're trying to provide, they're working their ass off. They like a lot of times parents and stuff are coming over from other countries where they're like doctors, lawyers, and none of those degrees are, are respected. So then they have to get like uh, like lower tier jobs than where than where they came from. Uh, so the like the financial situation is just is usually uh, the biggest stressor and finances it's like yeah if you run out of money what the fuck happens you starve or you got no home you got nowhere to go that stress and you have kids that you brought over right like yeah, so or that... the kids that you had here and that you need to provide for now yeah so that stress reverberates so it's like a, it's a it's both sides it's like the parents are trying to their hardest to keep everything up in the air and then it's how well do they deal with that it's like are they dealing with it in a great way where they're communicative with their kids and and telling them what's going on and and not putting that stress out onto them and then lashing out on them or are they just doing that exact thing the exact opposite of what i just explained no yeah exactly and i think that there's such a difference between kids who grew up in like a like a fear-based household versus an abundance-based household. I mean, there are different words to describe this, but like, I feel like a lot of decisions and ways of thinking about things are actually rooted in these more subconscious feelings. So like fear, uh, in one of my songs, I I write like, fear is such a motivator, but hope puts you in danger. Um, And like so much of our decision-making is based in this like subconscious fear. Cause I think like my theory is like, you know, evolutionarily, like we had fear and anxiety to keep us from running away from tigers and shit like that. And now it just is like, why am I afraid of my email? Yeah. Uh, and then you're, <laughs> yeah, you're like, Oh, why am I yeah. afraid of my email? Oh, because I'm subconscious because I am subconsciously associating that in all of these layers with fear of death. Cause you're like, what happens if I don't respond to my email? Oh wait, then that person will get, Oh, and then is that going to make me lose my job? Oh, and then I'm going to get homeless. Oh, I'm going to die. Oh, yeah. uh, and then you just go through that and like that was such a narrative that was taught to our generation and like like literally like and the anxiety and just like the fear around that i just kind of thought that was this normal thing that everybody felt and then you know so i felt like that growing up and then going to college um like berkeley uc berkeley is uh i went from 2011 to 2015 and during that time everybody was in that like you know post recession i'm so stressed i have all this college debt i need to like get a good job and everyone was just like in that so i was like okay cool everyone's like this right and then i joined the workforce at 22 and um and at first i was like oh i can't like i was so nervous at work that i was like i have adhd i have adhd i need i need to get adderall so i can work more so and then i like got a psychiatrist it took fucking forever because it's so hard to get mental health help especially during that time it was like 2015 um so i finally got like a psychiatrist to talk to me when i was like 22 and worried about losing my shitty corporate job that i left anyway and hated like like i was just like like who cares um now i'm like who cares but at the time it was so important to me and uh the psychiatrist like was like you don't have 80 well you do well he was like you have anxiety first and foremost and Mm. i was like what do you mean have anxiety? Like what like what do you mean by have? And he was just like, "Oh, like you have like and I was like, "Wait, other people don't have this?" And he was like, "No." <laughs> and I was like, "Wait, wait, 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 wait." Yeah. What do you mean ha- like I like and that like broke at 22, like that broke my brain, right? Because I cuz I was just like, "Oh, other people aren't living feeling like this all the time." Yeah, and I was just like, "Wait, this is a thing that uh, that I that I'm experiencing." That other people aren't experiencing. Wait, what the fuck? I don't want. I don't want to experience it. What the fuck? Yeah, one hundred percent. The and that whole like the the death aspect of it. The, um, the yeah the, yeah you know it's just like the death aspect of the it. The thinking you're gonna die. That was mm-hmm. honestly the, what lifted the anxiety big time for me was the acceptance of death. Being like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm gonna die. Because then now mm-hmm. that I try to consciously 
if I feel anxious about something, like whether it's like talking to a person or going into a meeting or whatever it is, if something gives me that anxiety, I consciously think, oh, like what's the worst thing that'll happen? It's like, oh, you're going to die. And it's like, oh, but you will die. And knowing that I'm going to die, it's, it gives me a sense of peace because mm-hmm. now I'm not like uncertain about the answer of the outcome. I know the answer of the outcome, which isn't like I go to the meeting, then I die. But if all roads will lead to me dying, regardless of the success or failure of whatever happens here. I think the comfort around the topic of death actually is such a root cause. Of, I mean, not a root cause, but it is a thing that is thought about in the dialogue of mental health, right? Like... um. I thought that there I saw this really interesting thought experiment the other day where it's like okay so everybody has to die right but what if nobody died um that's like a different alternative so mm-hmm. it's like okay you have this like the current world is like people die but in a world where nobody dies that's actually much worse yeah. like if everybody were to be immortal just like imagining what that world would look like like that is actually much worse. And so doing that thought experiment actually gives me a lot of peace in death. Have you, have you ever seen that show, uh, Love, Death, and Robots? Yes. So there's that one where it's like the future where everyone's immortal and everyone can live forever. And there's that guy who like hunts kids. He hunts people. <laughs> I haven't seen that specific episode, is, but like I've seen it. Up. I've seen enough episodes to be like, oh, this is what this is. Got it. Sidetrack on what we're talking about. What's your? Do you have a favorite episode of Love, Death, and Robots? Um. I don't know the name of it. Uh, oh, I mean, I have two. I, mean, I of the of the ones I've seen, I have two favorite episodes. Um, there's that one. I don't remember the names, but there's that one where it's like they're all on a ship, and there's that like weird the monster. Crab. The crab. I was the crab one is so yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. love like, I, the crab one. I love the crab one because it's just so scary and yeah. grotesque, and, and- also. The psychology behind it of like, yes. it's not like, oh, it's, this thing's hunting us. It's like, we're bargaining with this monster. Yeah. And we have to like create like, a, and then we're also talking to each other. And they're like, just that we're talking about anxiety. You want to have anxiety, be on a boat with a creature that's trying to eat you and wants, yeah. to, but also is like negotiating with you and you can't trust the people around you. Like the humans and the monsters are all a threat. That's an anxious yeah. situation. Yeah, dude. no. And where it's all, where it's like the psychology where it's just like everyone's being pitted against each other. Yeah, um, that one uh, and then the other episode that I really like is, um, The other one that stands out to me in my memory, it's the one where it's like, it's these two women in space and then, but like one of them loses oxygen really fast or whatever, or like dies or something. I don't even remember, but it's like, it basically, it's like one woman, they're both in space and she has to like drag the other one. Do you know which one I'm talking about? I think so. It's when she's in the spacesuit and she's kind of floating. Is that the one where she has to rip her arm off? Yeah. She has to like rip, like basically something happens where it's like, it's like these two women, I think, and they're like in a spaceship and they have this destination that they, Mm -hmm. where it's like, okay, they're in a spaceship, they land on a planet and they have this destination that they need to go to. And initially they're supposed to just walk there together or something. But what happens is like, Oh, I know which one you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Where it's like like, trippy and all this shit. Yeah. Yeah, where it's like, where, but, but like the the issue is, uh, like the main like the main plot is that like one of them has like something wrong with their spacesuit yeah, or something. Yeah, one dies and, it, and the other chick her oxygen gets fucked up, so she yes, has to hook yes, her oxygen yes, up to the other chick yes. and drag her body. Oh my god, yeah, and no, yeah. exactly, exactly. So like the reason yeah. why that stands out to me is because it's like, well, Elijah, it felt very deep and sim- like I mean, I was just when I was watching it. I was just projecting whatever the fuck I was going through on on that where it's like, okay, like it's she's like dragging her friend's dead body. Oh, I remember because like her auction doesn't work and she's just like, shit, my friend just died. And now but in order for me to get to the destination, I need to like take her oxygen and be in this fucked up situation where I'm dragging my friend's dead body and and like using the last of her oxygen until like the very end. Um, and, and, And like. And at first it's like this journey where it's like, wow, that's so fucked up. She has to like drag her like dead friend in the oxygen. And then it's like interesting because as it keeps progressing, I found myself personally like projecting just like what I was going through on it. And and so I kind of took it away. I was like, wow, this is like so symbolic of like when you're trying so hard to get somewhere to like, 
and, and you're like dragging this weight with you, right? Because at the very end of the episode, uh, do you remember the how it ends? Yeah, she doesn't. It, well, because the whole thing is her like she's like connecting to this like earth thing more and more, like the spiritual thing that's like communicating to her. And then doesn't yeah. she just end up dying, like accepting death and like moving on after? Like she's carrying this weight and won't mm -hmm. move on and is struggling to survive when really the answer is to just let go. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and it's really amazing, right? Because it is so where she's like dragging the body and then she finally gets to the cliff and the cliff symbolizes death, or at least that's how we're interpreting it right now, because it's just this like weird psychedelic death thing. Yeah. And then um, and, and it and it's so interesting, like the piece that she makes with it. Right. Like yeah. just that whole psychological battle. Um, But but yeah, I mean, like, I mean, that's kind of how I've felt my entire life struggling with mental health shit like i like I, I feel like i've been diagnosed with a bunch of random shit um and it's not like it's not all connected where it was like okay so when i first graduated and like got the psych evaluation where it's like oh you're anxious and i was like oh okay this is like a thing got it that, that other people don't have but then you know, I was like, oh, I don't want to get on medication. I want to solve it naturally because da da da. And also, um, uh, the, the conclusion that I'm eventually getting to is that I really like medication and that it works for me. <laughs> it works. It works. It's <laughs> uh, um, helped you a uh, lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I want to specifically speak to the resistance of getting on medication because I understand, like, why – people resist it and like you know obviously i didn't it wasn't like a smooth journey finding the right medication right it's really hard and shitty which is why people don't do it um it, it's, it's a lot of it's like a lot of health stuff right where mm -hmm. it's like um if you're never really taught how to take care of your health both mental and physical then it's hard to teach yourself how to do that as an adult because you're because there's so much going on yeah. right um but but like with so you know for the first so, you know, get diagnosed with anxiety uh, when I was like 22. And so it's like, okay, cool. So I've just been undiagnosed with anxiety, depression, whatever. My whole, I got it. Okay, cool. Um, and I was like, okay, I'm going to try and solve it naturally through like the typical shit, right? Where you're like, hey, I'm just going to be really healthy. Where it's like, oh, I was just doing the like, you know, working out every day. I'm really healthy. I'm in therapy. I'm sober. I'm meditating. I'm like all the typical shit. Yeah. And it wasn't enough. I still felt like total fucking shit. Um, and so that's like 20, so 2015 to 2017, I'm like just trying to solve it naturally. And uh, 2017, the year that I was doing all that like insane shit was the year that I like felt the most suicidal. And then luckily I was in a really good relationship at the time. Shout out to my ex, Jake. You're awesome. Sick, Jake. Um, yeah, no, <laughs> we're still homies. Um, but like, you know, I was, in living in San Francisco, I was really struggling, and then my ex was like, hey, why don't you try getting on meds? And I don't think I could have, like, gotten myself there. Like, I definitely was – I, like, needed someone to help me get there, which is the tricky thing about mental health, right, where it's like, you know, if your leg's bleeding, you can just be like, yeah, I'm going to heal my leg. But then when you're mentally – in a bad place, it's like really hard to get help because you're mentally in a bad place, which makes it hard to get help because you're mentally in a bad. And so it's like this vicious cycle where I've only been able to get to a mentally healthy place because I've had so many people help me and then also paying that journey forward of like helping other people get out of it. But anyway, but yeah, so like uh, I got on Lexapro in 2017. Do you know what that is? No, I'm, I'm not super familiar with, um, with, uh, like any government any drugs. Type, yeah. Any type of medication. Yeah. And also yeah. I think there's, cause I'm Canadian, there's not a, 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 there's not the same discourse with it and not the same availability. I think it's a lot harder for us to get certain things. And I, and there's mm. certain ones that we don't have up there. What's the, what's the big dick one that starts with a V big Viagra. Yeah, Viagra. Sorry, yeah, I keep yeah. thinking of Vicodin. Yeah, so oh, yeah. you are familiar with medication. Yeah, well, Viagra, kinds. Viagra's boner pills, man. Yeah, boner pills. Yeah, rule, yeah, boner dude. pills. Yeah, I mean, like for me, I'm just, I was just trying to get a boner for my mental health, where it was yeah. like, yeah, I'm so mentally healthy that all my neurons are jizzing. Um, but okay, wait, yeah, so boner pills. So yeah, okay, you do know medication. Some, some um, of them, some of them. I'm just not super familiar with like. Yeah, I've heard of Vicodin, but I don't know what Vicodin does. I've heard of Xanax because I know everyone does Xanax as like recreationally. Um, but that's I know Adderall. Like I know some of the big like kind of famous ones. Is Lexapro like on the that famous level? ones? Yeah, like no, no, the, that, that, no, that's so funny. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> uh, yeah, so. 
it's just really funny the way that you describe it. Like, yeah, I know the famous ones. Yeah, like the 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 big <laughs> name ones that have really no, broken like, into, into the mainstream. Dude, the other day, me and um, so uh, one of our previous guests, Don Z Potenza, we were talking about like if Adderall is the final boss of focus medication, right? Where it's like, okay, there's there's like shit that makes you focus. We were like, okay, if Adderall is the final boss of focus medication, then who's like the elite four? You know, if you're in Pokemon yeah, and you're yeah, like, yeah. oh, there's a champion, there's the elite four. You got to take so on your like, rival okay, at the end and then you got you got to go through the elite four first. Yeah, yeah, I feel Exactly, you, but, yeah. exactly. And then so um, so it's like, okay, if Adderall is the final boss, right, then the, the elite four is like Vivans, Ritalin, like some other shit and being 5'8". Being five uh, eight, because, being five yeah, eight well, helps you focus. Um, well, because we <laughs> we were we were just saying like uh, no, it was a joke based off of this. I, I saw this one stand up comic do a thing where he was doing a funny song where he was like, "Every guy you know is five eight. I, I wish I could remember his name, but he was like, "Yo, if even if he's six foot, he's five eight. Even if he's <laughs> five two, he's five eight. He just did this bit where every guy you know is five eight, and it, it was just a joke about like being not confident <laughs> oh you have the confidence of someone who's 5'8 oh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and then I was like oh yeah the, the lack of confidence from being 5'8 <laughs> I didn't say it that guy, that guy said it but will make you focus as hard as something like Adderall oh, um, but speaking okay. of the drugs <laughs> That's a good yeah, bit. but speaking That's of the drugs, uh, how tall are you actually? I'm six foot. I'm like five eleven and change. I'm like five eleven and three quarters. I just oh, okay. So yeah, you don't struggle with yeah. I'm mm. I'm I'm five seven, um, no. and then yeah. So I feel good. I feel this is a good height. Yeah, height's never been one like. I guess maybe like I think if you're like six one six two, that's hotter. But I wouldn't want to be any bigger than that. Obviously, I can't change my size. I could go crazy and like do one of those shin extension things. But like I would never do. I'm very happy with my height. But I think once you no, get it's a to great like, height. Yeah, and I, once and you I get to like, like six whole... three, six four, you're like life gets hard. Like planes oh, don't yeah. fit you. No, I like, definitely. I had to recently hard. stop fucking yeah. this six four guy, um, who I was fucking because it was just the ratio. It just like I don't know. My knees can't really do it anymore. Um, <laughs> well, no, it's just this well, old no, girl just, can't ride like she used to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, that was the excuse I made. It was actually just because I hated him. Um, you have a big and, dick. You have fat cock. On a- yeah, it was just one of those like you really like the sex, but you hate the person kind of a thing, yeah. and you can only really put up with that for so long. I mean, he right hated up. me too. We for sure hated each other. And but then, it's just you know, like fucking when you guys met in the ring, it was unreal. Fucking electricity. Yeah, yeah. But shit. I, but like, no, but literally, like, but, you know, like being addicted to like weird, unhealthy sex was a part of the. Oh, yeah. Was a part of me like figuring out my mental health shit, right? Where it was like, 100%. okay, so it was like 2017, I get on, um, I get on Lexpro. Actually, no. So first they were like try Prozac and that made me feel like shit so like this part that I'm about to talk about is like the reason why people are resistant to trying mental health medications because it's a big it's trial not, and like... error thing and also people have just a natural resistance to pharmaceutical companies because if, even though there's ones out there that will help you they have a track record of trying to be like sneaky and just make money off of people so that, yeah literally that's why people are like apprehensive towards it yeah and and it's like you know, it's not like the reviews are awesome, right? So, so because like I, the reason why I didn't get on them was not really because I even had that stigma towards them, but I just didn't think they would work. Mm-hmm. Like I just genuinely could not anticipate the reward because you just hear so many stories of people like being mentally ill and getting on medication and it not working. So I was like, why yeah. would it work for me? I'm not anyway, but it did. Thank God. So uh, Prozac didn't work for me. It made me suicidal for six weeks. Jeez. And then thank God my boyfriend at the time helped me through that. And then I got on Lexapro and that worked for me for a couple of years in terms of like just the anxiety. And then, um, but then, you know, you realize you have other shit going on. And yeah. then, so, uh, got on Lexapro, moved to New York in 2017 and then, you know, living in like East village, Manhattan. And I was working for Google at the time. And luckily at Google, they had a really good, therapist that i only had access to because i was working for google like again it's just so hard to get access and then yeah. while i was working for google in like 20 i don't know 19 or 20 i don't remember like just around that time then i got diagnosed with like all the other shit right then they were like by the way you're also bipolar and adhd and you have autism and i was like can you pick one they're like no man <laughs> like and then and i'm just like is there just like an umbrella term like they basically they're just like look like this is this something's is wrong with you and it could be all these things and i was like okay cool and then um and at the time so it was a couple years ago they were like you're bipolar and i was like it was actually a relief to get the diagnosis because i was like 
I was just like, there's something wrong with me. And then so was bipolar like the final diagnosis? Like when they said you're autistic and you're anxious and you have all these other things, was that just bipolar misdiagnosed? Um, no, they like eventually <laughs> like out of. OK, so the, the current agreement if from all. <laughs> yeah, the current consensus among all the doctors is like, um, yeah, bipolar, ADHD, autism, PTSD, uh, just shit that girls go through, you know? Yeah, girl, um, girl just, stuff. Just girl, girl stuff. stuff. Girl yeah, stuff. just girl Take stuff. Take your life flow, have your girl dinner. Like, that's the... Yeah, no, girl <laughs> dinner. It's all just girl dinner. Yeah, no, but, um, <laughs> but like, recently, I, uh, so I was like, oh, shit, all this stuff, is and then, um, but, yeah, but, like, I was diagnosed bipolar a couple of years ago, and, um, I didn't get on medication for it until recently, uh, so I've just been kind of, like raw dogging bipolar for the last couple of years and like self-medicating with like weed and shit like that to keep me stable because I wasn't encouraged to get on bipolar medication be like people that like so many of the doctors told me they were like yeah like you know you could get on this but like a lot of people report that you lose all sense of feeling and happiness and I was like well that sounds terrible but then Recently, my um, my just like my bipolar swings were getting so bad to the point where they were affecting like my physical health. Like I was like, uh, like it was just getting to the point where I was like, yeah, I need to do something about this. So then I got on this thing called I got on two things. I got on um, well, butrin and lamigdal. Uh, so the Lexpro kind of stopped working for me because I've been on it for a really long time. So the Lexpro was for like anxiety, depression, and then that cause that wasn't really working for me anymore. So I got on Wellbutrin, mm -hmm. which helped with the anxiety, depression, but not with the bipolar swings. And then I got on Lamigdal, which is a mood stabilizer, and that helps for like bipolar swings. And it's also used for people who have epilepsy because it just kind of decreases like activity in general. Um, and I feel great. And like, like before, I, I think um, I just always kind of felt like I had a galaxy brain or whatever, where it just felt like the, the everything ever all at once movie. I yeah. feel like that was the inside of my brain and yeah. it was totally unmanageable. Right. But I didn't really know any other way of existing. And I was afraid that getting on bipolar medication would take away all of my emotions and creativity, mm. uh, which is just like, uh, I don't know where I, the, who I there's, am. And it, there's a Duncan truck. You, you, uh, you saw me at gospel, right? Um, yes. There's one episode where they talk about that, where not specifically getting on medication, but the process of healing and worrying that it'll that'll take away your artistic gifts. Someone talks about being an alcoholic and how they were worried that if they stopped drinking, I think they were an author that they wouldn't be able to write anymore. And that, and that's like the drug, or in this case, like the the fear or the mental illness or anything being like giving you that self doubt to to, to steer you away from what you need to do to heal yourself. Exa no, exactly. And that was the dialogue that I was in with myself for the last couple of years of like, on one hand, being diagnosed with all that shit. Uh, to be honest, like getting diagnoses is a huge relief because mm -hmm. I think for so long, I'm just like, something is wrong with me and it's my fault. And I don't know. And like, uh, right. Because you're like mentally ill and you hate yourself. So you can't like think in a way that's like r rational and removed from the situation. Um, and, and like, I was so afraid of getting on bipolar meds because of like, just because the dialogue around it is really terrible. Right. Like, like, you know, there are so many, um, well-known creatives who are bipolar and like so much of, so many of the reviews are like, yeah, this just stripped me of all of my everything. And I'm like, yeah. wow, that's, that's, that's scary. That's frightening. Terrible. Yeah. 100%. Um, and yeah. And that is exactly what happened in the adjustment period. And it was like, I, I think the adjustment period to getting to the Migdal was like, for sure, some of the worst weeks of my life. For the sure. The one you're currently like, on? Yes. The adjustment period was brutal. I was so suicidal. Like, I was like, Jesus. you know. Yeah, I was, like, so close to literally just, like, killing myself, like, two months ago. Uh, obviously, I have great friends uh, who didn't let me do that. And I live in an amazing community of friends who I have forced to, who I've forced to be close to me over time. Um, yeah, just, you know, with, with my powers of, of also being a good friend who they want to be around. Um, but, but, like, I think the adjustment period is what detracts a lot of people from wanting to get on meds because a lot of times like you don't have like I'm so lucky to have the support network I do because going through that alone is like so like it was terrible because here's what happened so 
Um, my brain, here's what my brain used to feel like, and it doesn't anymore. So my brain used to feel like at any given point in time, I would have a bajillion thoughts happening and they would all be like competing for each other. And they're all like racing. Like, do you know, does that sound familiar to you? Oh yeah. Yeah. I've, I've described my thoughts many times as like two guys playing squash and it's just like, put that, put that, put that, put that, put that, just constant bouncing. I was able luck. I was lucky enough that like just like meditation really, really helped me with that. And like how to understand what it feels like to have a clear mind and that calmed me down. And then, yeah, like, uh, I do a lot of like anxiety exposure stuff. Like if I feel that something's making me anxious, I go and do it and that helped calm me down. Uh, and then yeah, just learn digging through my own stuff. I did a, like some pretty hard mushroom trips where I'd like mm -hmm. dug out a lot of bullshit and like mm -hmm. all those things. And I'm very fortunate enough that I've been able to use that to those psychedelic tricks. Those psychedelic trips will do it. Oh yeah, they they've done it for me at least. They've they've really really helped. I'm not I'm not a doctor. Anyone listening to this, if they're struggling with something mentally and they think that eating a bunch of mushrooms will solve it, that's not necessarily true. Uh, it's worked for me. It worked for a couple of my friends. But there's a lot of people I know who do a bunch of mushrooms and have not had healthy outcomes from it. Um, so yeah, I think it's just all like it's case by case, yeah. right? Because it's just all, like, chemicals, right? It's, like, your brain chemistry plus the chem – because like, psilocybin and, like, the context that you're in, the state that your brain's all in. All like, these things I are factors. What you ate that day. Did you have too much sugar? Did you have too much coffee? Blah, like, all that stuff is going to factor into your a mushroom trip. No, seriously. And I, I'm just so relieved now. Like, like, I can only speak for my bipolar experience. And one of the reasons I'm so open about it is just I see – online like how many people it helps like on one hand you know i get all this hate from people who don't think that it should be talked about and i don't care about them i'm doing it for That's the strange. mentally ill people who follow me and feel seen that like somebody is talking about it who's not ashamed and they like feel seen that like it's like cool like i'm not crazy this person who i like is going through it that makes me feel better and that's mm -hmm. why i talk about it because i wish i had like i just I just wish I had this growing up, right? Like, I wish I had someone talking about it growing up. So, like, growing up, I didn't feel so fucking crazy. But, but yeah, it was like, you know, I feel like I had this totally uncontrollable galaxy brain where it's like, um, like, any cartoon, like, uh, I think you've seen One Punch Man, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's this, uh, so that same person who made One Punch Man is... Uh, also made this thing called Mob Psycho 100, which yeah. I actually like better. Have you seen Mob Psycho 100? I've seen I've seen season one. Uh, that's all I've seen of it. But yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. It, yeah. So I actually um, I I I mean, it's not that it's better objectively. I just personally relate to it more because um, I just felt like, wow, this is like the inside of my brain. So Mob Psycho 100, it's like this kid who's psychic, but essentially he's neurodivergent, right? He's like hyper powerful, hyper intelligent, but he feels like there's something wrong with him. Yeah. Um, I'm not like gassing myself up being like, no, yeah, no, I'm no. this misunderstanding. And it's but a that's world just... where everyone has psychic powers. That's kind of like right. the, the theme. And this guy is like similar to One Punch Man, a, a leagues more powerful than ever, anyone right, for no right. real explainable reason. He just did. He was just, he was just born that way. Yeah. And then, and then he lives this life where everybody's like, you need to use this power for this. You need to use this power for that. And he's just this 10 year old kid. And he's like, wait, but I just want to like fit in with my friends and experience romance. Yeah. And yeah. that's so true. Right. Like, like I feel like for a lot of my life, people were telling me, that I was different and uh, not necessarily in a good way. Right. It was like, Oh, it was usually pitched to me as like, there's something wrong with you. And so that doesn't make you feel good. No. Uh, because I was just like, uh, and then, then I was like, am I like this weird person having this isolated experience? And I'm like, no, I'm actually human. And a lot of people are having this experience and it's just not talked about, um, enough, I guess. And so like, you know, being on Lamigdal, um, like, like, the adjustment period was so crazy uh, and I'm just glad that I'm here now. And, and I'm like, li like basically what, what happened was, okay, my brain went from being the inside of mob psycho a hundred, like everything ever all at once. Like any, like it just went from being this like crazy thing where it just felt totally unmanageable where it was just like, I just felt like, sh like racing thoughts. Like everything was like racing. And then my mood was so volatile. Like I could just like switch to like, really fucking happy to like really fucking sad to like really angry and then i would get paranoid um and i was like addicted to those swings right because i was afraid like oh shit like mania feels so good mm -hmm. 
and this is like the only happiness that I'm used to and that I feel familiar with. And I'm afraid that if I take this pill, I'll never feel happy again and that I'll also not be creative. And then so what's the point? Like, I'm not going to be happy and I'm also not going to be myself. So like, what's the point? Um, and that's exactly how I felt for four weeks when I was like trying not to kill myself. Um, I got on the amygdala. And here's what happened. That was so fucking scary in my brain. Um, it, like, I had never experienced anything like it before. So when I was first adjusting to the pill, it made my brain, like, completely hollow for, like, at least two to three weeks. And it was the most horrifying, scary thing that I've ever experienced where it was, like, we're basically – so, like, you know, typically as a human being, like, you just have all these thoughts, right? And you're just like, oh, thoughts, da 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 um, But literally it was, like – I just felt like I was having the worst fucking trip of my life for like two to three weeks straight um, where it was like all like literally my brain just went fucking flat. It was just silent where it was like I couldn't even generate thoughts on my own. Like I literally like this is for, for like two to three weeks. I was like this. I'm looking at a microphone. I'm looking at my pants. Oh. I need to eat now. Okay. Oh. Sleeping? Okay. That's literally what I was for like two to three That's weeks. That's fucking weird. No, and I mean, the thing is like, but I couldn't even generate thoughts. On, like, it's typically it's like thoughts are happening to you, right? And yeah. then you have your like, your like thinking on purpose brain and then your automatic brain and your thinking on purpose brain is like, yo, shut up. Uh, and then... um. And so basically it was just like this thing where I, I felt like I was in this bad trip where the only thought the only thought that I was able to have for two to three weeks straight, like from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to sleep, was just perceiving what was in front of me. That was the only thought I could have. Like I didn't feel hungry. Like I didn't feel anything. Like I just felt like a f like I just felt like a shell of a human being. And then I and of course that sent me into like a crisis, right? I was just like, Do we just wait, lose Mel? This is what Oh shit. Oh wait. Are you back? Can yes. Can you? Okay. Can you yeah. Hear yeah. Me? You're back. The the internet gods don't want me to talk about mental health because they know <laughs> that I'll be too powerful if I can get this dialogue out. They they know that I'm going to be too powerful. But um, yeah. To like wrap up this thought, um, where the first couple weeks of it was so scary because it was exactly what I was afraid of happening. Right. Yeah. Where, um, and, and you know, luckily my one of my like really good friends who's also bipolar um she went through that medication journey a couple years before me so she was able to like help me and be like hey don't worry it's not going to be like this forever uh and i really needed someone to say that to me right because in those because like two to three weeks of of that mindset is it well it'll really like do something to you it'll For really sure. make you really yeah, fucking absolutely. crazy and i needed someone to be like i literally needed someone to be like don't kill yourself it will get better don't kill yourself it will change like i needed that so bad and i'm glad i had it and it just um, after two to three weeks it just flipped you just got like you, no the... no it was a grad it was a gradual thing where um i think like i've been on it for two months now and i don't even i don't think i i don't think i really fully adjusted until like maybe like a couple days ago to be honest mm -hmm. like li like literally i don't think i've really adjusted until a couple days ago um because that's how long it that's how fucking long it takes right that's and and, crazy, and obviously yeah. like you know and people don't want to do it because you're because you're still working right it's mm -hmm. like i don't want to just like sit and feel weird in my room for two months like i got i, I want to still like i live got shit my to do fucking life yeah, right yeah. and and but like but basically so after uh three weeks like my it, it was just like my thoughts slowly started like stuff just slowly started coming back um and I started to, like, feel hopeful again once I started, like, where it's, like, more of me started coming back, right? Because I was just this, like, shell. And, and I was having this whole existential crisis of, like, do I have to literally choose between these two states of existence? Like, because this is terrible. And I don't want to live if I have to only choose between these two. Like, this is ter this is crazy. Yeah. Um, I was, like, I have to choose between this, like, suffering, vicious existence and this, like, flat one. That's there's that's not a life worth living um and then like getting better was like so amazing it was like crazy like I, it was just like like then you know three to four weeks hit and then my thoughts started coming back and my creativity started coming back and i was like thank god 
oh my fucking god because like that was what really scared me was like not being able to do anything creative um where i was just like who am i if not Uh, and then um and, and then then my thoughts started coming back and then my personality started coming back um, and then what was really hard, uh, like, at, so at six weeks, what was really hard for me to accept was the decrease in speed, which I'm honestly still having, like, I'm still having a hard time what accepting that. What do you mean by decrease because, in speed? Like, um, like, I know that, like, I'm talking really fast right now and that people perceive me as this, like, fast person, but I used to be faster. Uh, like, I mean, I know, I know how I used to be. Like, um, you know, we had Scumbag Dad on the podcast uh, the other week and how fast Brad is is typically how fast I am. Mm. Um. And I'm just so used to that level of speed and it was such a huge part of my self-worth. And so letting go of that speed, because I feel like I operate now, like the inside of my brain feels like it operates at half the speed with which it used to. And that's really hard to accept, right? Because I used, I like have prided so much of myself in my intelligence, frankly, like my ability to think creatively and quickly. Um, But you know, just accepting that, like, hey, maybe speed isn't part of the... Well, that's anyway, kind of but... the sacrifice you're making is, like, to have this balance. Now you're in a balanced state rather than being, like, really high and really low. You can can consistently be where you need to be. And this is way better. Yeah. This is way This is way better. And I wish that the me now could go back in time to my younger self and be like, yo... You heard this is way or, better. Or Do, or this what, or, yeah. Do this earlier. Do this earlier. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it to every bipolar person. Everyone's like on their own journey. But for me personally, I wish that I that the me now could go back in time and be like, "Do this earlier. It's way better." But That's now cool. I feel like it's like, like it feels good now. Like it's like, oh, I feel like even though I'm slower, the relief that I have from like the cycles is so good and like whatever like 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 you know the little bit of mania i miss like all the little things i miss about what i was like before pale in comparison to how good i feel now and the relief i have now and i like can't even believe that i was like afraid of losing those things um because i couldn't anticipate this like good state of being yeah, right? like you i just couldn't didn't think know it was gonna you happen. wouldn't it, like it, you can't perceive how you're gonna feel in the future on these drugs based on how you're feeling right now like it's it's you you wouldn't know the comparison until you actually had it exactly and and it's like it's so hard to anticipate and i just hope that like you know whoever is watching or listening to this like if if this if me sharing this helps even one person on their mental health journey then like that's that's kind of my goal in general with talking about mental health like i think that I've heard so much feedback of like, are you just like pretending to be mentally healthy for like attention because it's hot right now? And I'm just like, dude, if I were going to die for is attention, it would be something else. Right okay? now? Pretending to be mentally healthy. That's the hot thing. Yeah. <laughs> that's crazy I mean, that like, people give you that that kind of feedback. I, it's just because I'm a girl, dude. If you're a girl yeah. on the internet, people will say anything. I uh, I have not been offended by anything in like over yeah, no, no, Many it's true. Years. I got a few yeah, friends, it's just, it's, oh, like you included, yeah. who are like, yeah, online creators. And just the the stuff that ladies get online, it's like, I don't know. My, my comment section and the guys who I talk to are all just like, yo, sick. They send me a video of some girl, like, flexing her butthole through her yoga pants. And they're like, yo, look at this. This is crazy, right? That's <laughs> like, my, my, I love my guys. They're great. That's great. I mean, yeah. that is a love language, right? It is. It absolutely Sending is. those videos, that's a fucking love language. 100%. And men need that. Men need to love each other out loud. We um do. We But do. yeah, like overall, like I um, am so glad that like I can be at this point in my life where I'm finally mentally healthy and stable because I think that I just never thought I would be here, right? Like mm-hmm. I think so much of mental illness is – like lies your own mental illness lies to you and tells you that you can never get better and that you just have to like figure out some existence that doesn't suck so much um and and, and, like yeah like i feel like i was so addicted to these like cycles and now that i'm like that i'm like two weeks into the mood stabilizer i'm like oh i actually can have my cake and eat it too like my personality is back my creativity is back but i can actually think clearly and linearly um and not have my emotions be like crazy and like affecting me like it's not not that it's like bad to have emotions but my but like my actual mood swings were like so like (laughs) they were like this (laughs) um but but yeah like 
thank you for listening. Seriously. Hey, dude, it was a, this was a great one. I think, uh, yeah, no, I think you, I think anyone who is listening to this, who's any, maybe struggling with any sort of mental health stuff, this would be very helpful. Um, yeah. And so, yep. And I think that's all the time we have for this episode That's it. of thank you. Come again. So, uh, we hope you all climax with us at least once today, especially when I was talking about, uh, yeah, climax to me talking about struggling with getting on. Yeah, the Mitchell, suicidal thoughts fuck. part. That's when you. Yeah, not, that's when I you mean, people do get. On, I mean, that is a kink, right? I mean, you got to come somehow. Got to come somehow. Uh, guys, <laughs> if you are listening, please rate and review us on whatever you're listening to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, five star review. We would love that. Go check us out on our Instagram page as well at Thank You Come Again. Uh, make sure you're commenting on the videos. We're going to start looking through those comments, digging through those. Uh, we're going to be responding responding to some of the comments that we have on some of the videos. If you want more content from either of us, you can find me at Che Durena. That's C-H-E-D-U-R-E-N-A on all platforms. Chedurena.com for all tour dates, as well as Little Dinky News on Twitch and Kick. And Mel, hit them with your socials. Little Dinky News. Oh, man, that one always gets... <laughs> I love that. Um, and where you can find me is I am Sailor Mel 369420 or Sailor Mel 69420. Whatever. If you type in Sailor Mel, you'll find it. I'm Sailor Mel on uh, either 369420 or 69420 on all platforms. And yeah, do not forget to follow our pod. It is at thank you come again pod on instagram and that's where i will be checking or where, we'll, where we will both be checking and reading your comments and talking about them next time so yeah thank you again so much for coming and for also listening to the podcast bye bye